All right. So we were looking at the implementations of some basic kinds of latches, right? And essentially, we saw was if I want to implement a latch, the first thing that I need is some kind of a bistable element that can hold a value even after the input has been removed, right, or disconnected. And the other thing is, how do I sort of change the value of that bistable element? So the typical common thing that we were looking at was the most simple form of bistable element is something like this, and we can either use a switch or pass transistor to break the loop or just use sizing of transistors to force data. Right? So you can force an update on the data and change the value that is stored inside this by stable element. So those are the two common methods that are considered. Okay. So the question becomes now how do we sort of use this? And this of course as we said, uh, you know, the techniques that we saw were generally things like one of the things we could do for example was this kind of a configuration where I apply C and C bar, apply D over here and get Q over here, right? Of course, in this case, the D gets inverted by the time it's transferred over to Q, but in general, that's okay. I don't care about a signal inversion as long as it is always inverted, right? I can take care of that somewhere else in my logic if I need to, okay? So the question becomes, okay, once I have a setup like this, right? This can of course be used as a level triggered latch Whenever C is equal to 1, this latch is transparent and D gets transferred to Q. Right? Whenever C is equal to 0, Q retains its state. Right? So that's the functionality. Okay? Now, one small issue which I want to point out now and which will again be considered later as we are looking at different configurations is how am I actually going to, supposing I want to use this particular circuit, right? How am I going to generate the C and the C bar, the clock and clock bar signals? Okay. Huh? Okay, so one possibility that you can use in fact for something of this sort, right? So for the clock and clock bar signal, what he is suggesting is we can use BCBSL. Right? Now, in some sense that is overkill because all that I need is I have a square wave signal which I just need to take a signal and invert it. It is not like I need to do a computation. I do not need to do AND of something or NAND of something. Right? So, DCVSL may not be necessary. Having said that, the idea is actually a good one. Right? The important thing, the one very crucial thing that DCVSL gives you is the fact that both the C and the C bar transitions happen essentially at the same time. Okay, it generates both C and C bar together. Okay, but if I did not want that, all that I'm saying is, you know, C is coming from somewhere. It's already a square wave signal that I'm generating from outside. Then how would I generate C bar? You already have C. How do you generate C bar? Use an inverter, right? What happens? What's the problem with that? Huh? There's a delay through the input. Okay. So what will C and C bar look like? Supposing I say that C goes through an inverter and comes out as C bar, what will the waveforms for these two look like? C will look something like this. Okay. C bar will look as an inverted form of this, but with a small propagation delay. Okay. So it will look something like this. I'm exaggerating that delay over here. It won't be well. It all depends on your time scales, but you know, I mean, it may not be like so blatantly obvious that there that one is delayed with respect to the other. Okay, but in this case, at least I am saying that C bar is derived from C by putting it through an inverter. Therefore, C bar is always going to be delayed with respect to C. Okay, what that means is I will end up with these two intervals out here. that are problems, right? 
why are there problems? Because essentially what is happening in this first interval is I have a so called 1 1 overlap and in the second place I have a 0 0 overlap. Right? That is at that first transition when C is going from 0 to 1 I have a short amount of time few picoseconds right or maybe few tens of picoseconds at most but some amount of time during which both C and C bar are equal to 1. Similarly on the other side I have a short amount of time when both C and C bar are equal to 0. Okay. So both these overlaps in other words exist. Okay. What is the implication of that? What happens to this circuit if there is an overlap between C and C bar? First let us consider the slightly simpler situation what happens when C and C bar well okay neither of them are simpler but anyway uh, all right what happens when both C and C bar are equal to 1 right so for that short duration it is as though I have basically shorted that input T and this feedback right so the relative size between the input and the feedback could sort of affect what happens at this node X right it is not for a very long duration okay after some time of this C bar is going to turn off right or uh, you see when does this happen when does the 1 1 overlap happen when C is going from 0 to 1 which means C bar is going from 1 to 0 ok all that I am saying is the C bar going from 1 to 0 became a bit late ok so for a short amount of time both are 1 during that time the voltage at X is the combination of whatever is coming from D and whatever is coming from the feedback Okay. But after that the feedback gets cut off after few picoseconds right? and then during that time B is still on. So most likely as long as B itself is being driven by a proper static CMOS gate there will not really be any issues there will just be some short duration during which the voltage at X could go indeterminate after that it becomes a proper logic value driven by D that in turn goes through the inverter and comes out at Q. But there is a possibility that for a short duration there is some confusion over there. Okay. Similarly, there could be the other problem at the falling edge when C is going from 1 to 0. Okay. Now what happens is C has fallen from 1 to 0, so D gets cut off from X. Okay. But C bar is also still 0, it has not yet become 1 which means the feedback has not kicked in ok once again it is a small duration unless x sort of very quickly starts floating away and becomes indeterminate over there and, and in turn causes that inverter to flip we should not really see any problems ok so why am I pointing this out at all if there are no problems associated with it it turns out that when you try using this in a slightly different context it can actually lead to problems Okay. We will look at that a bit later. Okay. So this business of overlapping clocks is something that physically exists simply because of the way that we generate the clocks right? and we need to have some way by which we can avoid the problems that it creates. Okay. All right. So the next question that we need to address is all right, this is all good for transparent latches but for reasons that we will sort of understand a little bit better when we start looking at timing analysis, edge triggered registers are actually slightly easier to use than transparent latches. Right? Transparent latches can be used but they have some problems in that the timing analysis and so on becomes a little bit more, more tricky with them. Okay? So if that is the case, how can I construct an edge triggered register by using the transparent latches is the question. Right? The mechanism that we use for that is to say I will go for a configuration which I call a master slave configuration. Right? This is not a circuit by itself, it is a way by which I can construct an edge triggered register by using a combination of level triggered latches. Okay? So what we say is I will take one level triggered latch, I will call it the master. 
I will take its output and directly feed it into another level trigger lab that I will call the slave. Okay. So this is the D input of this one, the Q output, the D input of the second one and the Q output of the second one. Okay. So what's the difference over here? All that I do is I take the clock, connect it over here, invert that clock and feed it here. Okay. And I will say, I will take this dotted line that I am drawing over here as the overall boundary for my circuit element. Right? So this becomes the overall D and this becomes the overall Q. Right? Which means that my actual circuit becomes, now I put an H trigger on it, C, D and Q. Okay? Now along with this H trigger I need to put a bubble over here that bubble indicates that it is negative edge trigger. Okay? Why is this negative edge trigger? Let us look at it and analyze how this circuit works. Right? To understand why exactly we are calling this negative edge trigger. Okay? So how does this work? First thing, C is equal to 1. At that point, this signal which I will call C1, right? it is actually C bar, okay? is going to be equal to 0. Right? C equal to 1, C1 equal to 0. Whatever change is there at D will come through to Q1. Okay, Q1 will get updated with the value of D. Okay? But Q2 cannot change because C1 is equal to 0. Okay? So whatever is at Q, that is the overall output of this block, will remain unchanged during this entire time. So the entire time that C is equal to 1, Q is not allowed to change. Okay. After that, C becomes equal to 0. What happens? Q1 freezes. Right? No further changes are allowed in Q1 as soon as C becomes equal to 0. Okay, so that is the first thing to keep in mind. Q1 freezes. At the same time, C1 goes to 1 which means that whatever was there at Q1 will go to D2 and therefore will go through to Q2. Okay? So whatever was there at Q1 at the time that C went to 0 will get transferred through the second latch and will come out of the output. Okay. Which means that only at that transition when C is going from 1 to 0. After that what happens? Okay. So for the rest of the time, now C is equal to 0. Right? C1 is equal to 1. But because C is equal to 0, Q1 is not going to change. Therefore, I will not see any more changes at Q either. Right? Because Q1 is not allowed to change, therefore D2 is not allowed to change, therefore D Q2 is not allowed to change. Okay. Or rather, D2 will not change and therefore Q2 will not change. I mean, it is allowed to change, but it will not change because nothing has changed at the input. Okay. So, by having these two in configuration, right? so during the time that C is equal to 1, nothing can go directly from D to Q. It can go only up to Q1. When C goes from 1 to 0, whatever is at Q1 will get copied over to Q2. Okay? And that is it. It is not allowed to change again after that. What happens next when C is equal to 1? Once again what happens is Q2 freezes. Right? Q1 allowed to change and we are back to the first step. So you can see over here that any change in Q can happen only at the time when C goes from 1 to 0. Okay? Which is why we call this configuration 
a negative edge triggered register ok the other term for it is this type of register is usually called a D flip flop ok it is usually called a negative edge triggered D type flip flop D flip flop simply because it is a data registering flip flop it just captures the data whatever is presented at its input ok so this is effectively a negative edge trigger D flip flop ok how do I create a positive edge trigger D flip flop huh? <coughs> you can either invert the clock Right? So, all that I need to do is essentially make sure that after the C gets into the system, I first invert it. Right? So, that I am effectively using the C equal to 0. That is, you know, so I would have a configuration something like this. With respect to this C, it is now going to be positive edge trigger, right? Because C1 now is the actual clock that is being fed into the master slave, which is the invert of C, right? The C2 that we have over here is once again same as C. How would I actually feed it in the other way? That is not very clear. Maybe I could also inject it C from the other side in order to save an inverter or something. So, there are a couple of different ways in which I could think about doing this, right? The other possibility is I could have thought about using huh? taking the output at Q1 does not help. Taking the output at Q1 will not help because Q1, D1 to Q1 is transparent whenever C is 1. So then what will happen if you take the output at Q1 then any time that C is 1 then D will continuously get transferred to the output. You do not want that to happen. right? What you can do instead is make these negative level trigger. What does the negative level trigger latch mean? It means that whenever that control signal C is equal to 0, it is transparent. And when C is equal to 1, it is opaque. Okay. So, never, uh, negative level trigger latches can be used in order to construct a positive edge trigger register. Or I could say that, you know, I just take the clock, invert it, feed it in, once again invert it and feed it into the slave. Right? Or maybe why I could have done something like I connect the clock in such a way that it first goes to the slave then gets inverted and goes to the master. Right? It does not really matter. Either or any of those configurations will do the same job for me. So, there are multiple ways by which I can change between negative edge trigger and positive edge trigger. Okay? It is not that one is easier to build than the other. They are pretty much the same. Okay? Alright. So, now let us look at building this using one particular configuration, right? I am going to consider a situation where I use this as my configuration in order to build up a edge trigger flip flop ok c over here c bar over here c bar over here c over here right <coughs> oh no wait a minute actually this is a bad idea yeah so then this is one possibility but in order to illustrate the problem that I am talking about, I look at a slightly different configuration.
when why have I taken the outputs from these intermediate points? It doesn't really matter. I've connected it in this particular configuration, right? I, because it makes it slightly easier to see where the problem is. Okay. <laughs> so this, how does this work? This is once again an edge triggered register. Okay. Why? Because each of the stages is essentially going to act as a level triggered latch. They are connected in a master slave configuration, right? How is that happening? Because the C and C bar are connected them appropriately over here. Okay. Each of the individual units, those two inverters with that feedback loop over there, form a level triggered latch. Okay. Now, let's consider what happens to this circuit when we have a overlap between the C and C bar. Okay. So let's consider a situation where C goes like this. and C bar goes with a delay, okay. So that we have over here a 1-1 one overlap and over here a 0-0 zero zero overlap, okay. Yeah. How? Huh? A half cycle delay. Okay, so the suggestion is instead of inverting the clock, can you shift the clock by half a cycle? Right? In general, that's harder to do. Okay. Now, why am I saying it's harder to do? Because an inverter is very easy, right? I know that I can just put an inverter over there, it has some propagation delay 10 picoseconds or whatever. A delay, on the other hand, let's say that I'm running at 100 megahertz, right? I want a precise delay of 5 nanoseconds. It has to be exactly 5 nanoseconds, it cannot even be 5 nanoseconds plus 20 picoseconds. Right? Because that would mean a 20 picosecond overlap. Okay. Getting that kind of that's an analog delay that we are talking about. Because I'm taking a signal and I'm just putting it through an analog delay of 5 nanoseconds. Getting it to that precision is I don't know if it's possible. Quite frankly, I am not an expert in analog design. I don't believe it is possible. It is definitely not straightforward. Getting such an accurate delay will require a large amount of circuitry on its own. So it will not solve the problem, in other words. Rather, it might solve the problem, but it will be very difficult to implement. Okay? Huh? So multi-phase generator is sort of getting closer to the thing. So what you are saying out there is essentially that you would have something of this sort. <coughs> you would have some kind of clock input coming in and you would have some C1 and C2 which are coming out over here which are exactly phase shifted by a certain amount. Right? Now that is closer to where we are finally getting. So it might be possible to in fact get something of that sort. Even there it is difficult to sort of say whether you can get it with that less than 10 picosecond or less than 20 picosecond difference. Right? That much is just probably falls within even the jitter of the clock. Okay, so that's the kind of accuracy that we are talking about over there, right? So in other words, this will generate two signals that are separated, which nominally are exactly 90 degrees out of phase, right? The problem with that is, it is 90 degrees plus minus some tolerance, right? How much is that tolerance? We are talking about an inverter delay was after all only 20 or 30 picoseconds. And even that we are saying could potentially cause problems. We don't know what kind of problems yet, but potentially problems. Can you get multi-phase generators which have less than that level of uh, discrepancy between them? That is very hard to do. Okay. So anyway, let's quickly look at what is the problem that arises in such a situation and look at a couple of different methods by which we can go about solving. Okay. So, First things first, I mean, is this configuration that I have drawn a negative edge triggered or a positive edge triggered register, BFF? Huh? It's negative edge triggered, right? It's pretty much the same configuration I drew earlier, right? When C goes to the first one, C bar goes to the second one, okay? Yeah, in other words, the first one is transparent when C is equal to 1, the second one is transparent when C is equal to 0, okay? So, what happens to this under the situation? So in other words, you know, where I would really have problems with this is during the 1-1 overlap, right? 
if I ever have a situation with a 1 1 overlap like this, if my output changes, if my output is allowed to change, that's when I can actually say that look this is a problem, right? During the 0 0 overlap if something changes, that is anyway close to, if the output changes, that is anyway close to the C falling edge, that is when I normally expect the output to change. If I am saying that you know this is some undesirable change in the output, then I can probably take care of it by putting a guard window around it, my setup and hold time. Right? I say that I either increase my setup time or increase my hold time and say don't allow any changes to happen in this interval. Okay? We will just look at setup and hold time again briefly to understand that. But anyway, for the time being, the point is the falling edge of C is something where I am actually allowed to have transitions at the output. Okay? The rising edge of C, no matter what happens, I should not see a change in the output. But there is a problem over here. Right? Because I have this path. When there is a 1 1 overlap, I essentially have a problem that I have a path like this. Well, okay. That red line over there is essentially saying because both of those NMOS transistors are seeing 1 temporarily, it is possible that the value at D can directly influence the value at Q. Yeah. Yes. Correct. So, I mean, it is not that this is straight away going to cause problems, it is that. See, the issue is that what I am expecting is that the C bar has become opaque, right? At this, by the time, so my problem is, if this signal reaches here, before C bar completely turns off, if it reaches this X, right? Before C bar has completely turned off, then it will go through, right? So now it becomes a sort of a race condition. C bar is turning off, the signal is also coming through over here or rather some change in signal is coming through. Both of them are happening with one inverter delay. Depending on which one comes first, you can potentially have a change in the output. Right? This is sort of a race condition. Right? There are two different signals that could potentially change. Depending on which one comes first, you may or may not see a change in the output. Right? So it's not that this is guaranteed to fail. The problem with something like this is even worse. If something is guaranteed to fail, it's okay. You know that you can't use it. But in this case, it will work most of the time and fail sometimes, depending on which one came earlier and whether there was a change in the input at all. Okay. So yes, what we pointed out over here, the fact that you know after all D is going through an inverter before it reaches X, there is some delay, right? That should prevent it from sort of going through. But C bar is also coming with exactly one inverter delay. Now, depending on which of those inverters had a greater delay, which of the whether the pass transistor that C had had a delay whether the turning off of the C bar took longer, lots of extra variables come into the picture that we cannot generally design for easily. Okay. Ideally, we would like to see if this is a problem that can be completely avoided. Okay. Can I sort of prevent this kind of an issue from rising at all? Okay. So, one approach that is done is to say, okay, I have two possible overlaps, 1, 1 and 0, 0. Which one is the problem? 1, 1, right? Because like I said, the 0, 0 overlap is anyway happening when C is falling. Anyway, Q is allowed to change at that point. Okay? Is there a problem during the 0, 0? Actually, for this configuration, no, because what happens is all my NMOS transistors are off. So, the 0, 0 is not really an issue over here. Right? For other configurations, maybe using pass transistors, I might have a situation where 0, 0 also could have a path leading from input to output. Right? But that is less of an issue because anyway my output is allowed to change over there. The only question that I need to answer is, is it the correct value that is coming through to the output? By putting an extra constraint on the whole time, saying the input is not allowed to change at this stage or so close to the clock edge. Right? I can take care of that. Right? The 1 1 overlap is a more serious problem. So, then comes the question can I do something specifically to solve a 1 1 overlap condition? Right? 
there is one particular circuit which can be used to do that. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. I'm not sure if I have the circuit exactly right. Okay, so what happens in this configuration is that whenever c is equal to 1, x1 is essentially forced to 0, right, because it is the NOR gate output, right. Whenever c1 is equal to 1, x2 is forced to 0, okay. As a result of this, yeah, so what will happen is you will end up with two signals which look something like this. You can work through the exact delays. What I would suggest is go and draw out the complete timing diagrams. Effectively, what we are saying is how do we draw the timing diagrams for a circuit such as this? I consider what are the forcing values. Whenever C becomes equal to 1, I know that X1 is going to be forced to 0. Whenever C1 is equal to 1, X2 is going to be forced to 0. Right? After X1 is forced to 0, with some delay, this point over here, which I will call Y1, will become 1. Right? Z1 will become 0 after some delay. Okay? Similarly, Y2, Z2. What we have over here with the NOR gates is essentially a kind of an SR latch type of configuration but with some extra delay due to those inverters. Right? Effectively, what we will get at the end of it is that we will get signals which look something like this. Right? So, there will be 0, 0 overlaps at every one of these transitions. Okay? Effectively, in other words, x1 goes low before x2 has a chance of going high. Similarly, x2 also goes low before x1 has a chance of going like a high. 0, 0 overlaps, in other words, are permitted. Right? But 1, 1 overlaps are not. Okay? In some sense, as far as we are concerned, it solves our immediate problem. What happens as a result of this? The clocks, x1 or x2, whichever one you are considering as the clock, is no longer at a 50% duty cycle. Right? The on time is less than the off time. That is okay. The time period remains the same. Right? So, the frequency of the clock remains the same. The duty cycle changes in such a way that there are no 1-1 one -one overlaps. Okay? So, this is one possible circuit that can be used in order to create so called non overlapping clocks. Okay? That is one possible way of solving the problem of the 1 1 overlap in the case of creating a master slave type of D flip flop. Right? Another approach that is sometimes used. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Pmos in the same CMC. Okay. Right. So what you are saying is you will add two Pmos in that line from X to over here. Why would you add two Pmos just to add a delay? Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, no, so fine, see, uh, there are other issues with that, what will happen is the moment that you introduce PMOS transistors in series in a path like that, a PMOS transistor as uh, acting as a pass transistor has a certain delay associated with it, which means that it is effectively going to act as an RC somewhere, right, in your circuit, okay, whether that delay is acceptable or not is a different question. So, one thing which I want to make clear, the solutions that I am giving here are not unique. Okay, what you, the ideas that you have may work and that is one of the things that you need to keep in mind as far as this overall course is concerned, right. What I am presenting are one set of possible designs, there are others. In general, the best way for you to sort of understand exactly if you think that some other configuration may be better is to try it out, right, actually implement it in SPICE, simulate it and see what happens. Typically, what you will find is that most of the other configurations have certain other issues with them. For example, putting PMOS in series will increase the delay through the chain, okay, which may not be desirable. It may be acceptable, but it may not, you know, it will effectively what it does is it changes the clock to output delay of the system. Because when the clock actually changes, it requires that much extra time for whatever is at X to go through to the output, okay. So, that may not directly be the right solution for what you want over there. Increasing TCQ may not be your option. Okay. But keep that in mind, many of these other suggestions can also be made to work. In fact, they may already have been tried out. Right? Flip-flop design itself is fairly old. I mean, people have been looking at it for probably 40 years or so. Right? So many configurations have been tried. Having said that, there is still a possibility that something that you come up with may not have been tried before. Chances of finding something fundamentally new which is like fundamentally better than whatever has been tried so far are very less because people have been working on this for a very long time, right? But having said that, I am not by any means covering all the possible con uh, configurations over here, okay? I am presenting some of the main problems that arise, okay? So yes, if you do come up with other methods by which this can be solved, there are other methods, okay? What I am presenting, for example, this non-overlapping clocks is one particular technique that is used in order to avoid the problem that arises due to overlapping of clocks. There are other methods also that can be used. Okay. So, yeah, just keep that in mind. Right. So, yet another method that can be used for this, right, is that we come up with a slightly different configuration of the basic latch itself. Okay, and see how it can be used in order to construct a, a flip-flop, right? So one of the things that we are going to see is, let's look at this particular circuit. What does this circuit do? Where C is once again a clock type of signal, meaning that it's basically a square wave that's going to be applied to it. Okay? Forget about overlaps for the time being. How does this work? What does it do? What happens when C is equal to 0? Okay. So both the PMOS and NMOS will be on because C is equal to 0, C bar is equal to 1. So what does it look like? Looks like a CMOS inverter, right? What happens when C is equal to 1, C bar is equal to 0? Huh? Tri-state, right? What, what do you mean by tri-state? Effectively what we are saying is that Y is disconnected, right? it goes into the so-called high impedance mode. That is, we do not have a conducting path from Y to either VDT or to ground or anywhere else. Okay? So, this configuration is sometimes 
labeled in fact with this symbol right this is called a tri state inverter okay so that symbol essentially what we have is an inverter with a line on top of it indicating that that's a controlling signal okay why is the bubble over there because it's a negative controlling signal then c is equal to zero is when it actually conducts it behaves as an inverter when c is equal to 1 it turns off okay so this is a tri state inverter i could also have created the opposite phase tri state inverter by changing the nature of where i connected c and c bar that's all okay now we are going to use this before that i just want to quickly look at another configuration right where i'll say a very similar looking configuration okay is this also a tri state inverter so this is yes on the face of it it is sort of a tri state inverter but it's a bit more problematic why so what is happening is consider the case where c is equal to 0 c bar is equal to 1 then everything is fine right once again just that p mos and the n mos both are conducting they drop out of the picture the output is determined by d that when c is equal to 1 and c bar is equal to 0 right effectively what i have is just Okay, this is floating. This is floating. D is connected to Y. What happens if D now changes? Because of those capacitances that are there between gate and drain, the value of Y will also change because now Y is floating. It is not connected to any either zero or VDD, right? Why did that problem not happen in the other one? because the c and c bar the ones that were disconnecting were the ones closer to y so any change in d would get stopped at the c and c bar inputs itself they would not reach up to y okay so the first configuration in other words is a better tri state inverter the second one sort of is a tri state inverter but does not really have good behavior right so keep that in mind there are number of situations like this where something which looks very similar can have pretty bad characteristics when you actually look at the details of how it works okay all right so the question is how can we use that tri state inverter right what we are going to say is we'll use it in a configuration that looks something like this what has happened with this effectively what you have said is i now have a configuration where when c is equal to 0 the first stage is conducting whatever changes i make in d will come through up to x but because the second stage is opaque right why is that because c is equal to 0 c bar is equal to 1 so the second is in the tri state whatever change happens at x will not go through to y okay when the opposite happens when c is equal to 1 and c bar is equal to 0 the first stage is okay so any change in d will not come through to x whatever was the value at x will now go through to y okay so once again, again overall this becomes a edge trigger
flip flop. Okay. Now, what we want to see is how does this perform under the analysis of you know the, the different kinds of overlaps and so on. Uh, we are out of time now, so we'll stop at this stage. We'll continue with this in the next class.